want to say uh, hello as well to the people on the video streaming today. We're very glad that you're joining us. And uh, thank you for the cards and the messages that we've uh, received from you this week. You know, a very shocking thing happened this week, didn't it, with uh, the hurricane hitting. It's a, just been reading the stories day by day, things going on. They say now well over 100 people have been confirmed, killed through the storm. Tens of thousands, maybe, I guess, even in the hundreds of thousands of people, millions maybe without power. Uh, but certain islands, I was reading about Stanton Island, 80,000 people, no power still, you know, today. People are very cold because the temperatures there in New York are in the low 30s at nighttime. The overnight temperatures are very cold. You know, the water's cold. And, you know, if you've ever lived in a, a winter climate, when you get cold, it's hard to get warm. It's just one of those things. It, it's just, it gets in your bones and it's... It's just really hard. I can feel for the people that are there with no heat, and it's supposed to actually get down to 30 degrees uh, in two more days. So, you know, those who don't have heat will be in uh, below freezing temperatures, and uh, it's just really cold. And you, you look at the events that are happening, you know, it's tough to get the gas. It's tough for people to, uh, you know, they, there's gas in the ground, but they can't get it out because there's no electricity to pump it out. And the gas stations that do have gas are having trouble keeping filled with gas, and they're trying to unload it, you know, and the waiting lines, they say, are like, you know, three and a half to six hours to get gas, you know, just so that you can have fuel. And people are looking for food and, and help, and, you know, there's starting to get some anxiety going on, and, you know, now, the, you know, the reality sets in. Where do you stay? How do you live? You know, how do you go on from, from this moment? There's a lot of rebuilding for a lot of people that needs to take place. You know, and here we are. We, we weren't affected by the hurricane here. We have opportunities to help in, in ways that we can. But what kind of hurricanes are going on in your life right now? What kind of trials are you facing? A well, hurricane's a big trial. I mean, you see it on the news, you see the devastation. But you know, I imagine there's things in a lot of your lives that I'm speaking to today, things that are out of your control, things that you didn't necessarily bring on yourself. Like, you know, just there are storms in life. There are things that happen. And you know, when we go through the trials of life and we go through the storms that are out of our control and we, we go through, there's a tendency in our carnality to say, what are you doing, God? You know, it, without a doubt, there is a news program somewhere because I've heard so many throughout my lifetime saying, if God exists, where is he? If there is a good God, why would this happen? It's a question that comes up every time there's a big tragedy. You know, when things are great, God is forgotten. But when bad things happen, God is blamed. Right? It seems to be the course of our society. God gets blamed for every problem, and he's ignored with every blessing. But I want to ask you to search your heart today. When things aren't going well, when things aren't going your way, when there's things that happen out of your control, and there's nothing that you can do about it, where is your heart with God? Where's your heart with God? You know, when someone is facing a, a serious disease, they're alive, but the disease is on them. Humanly, we may not be able to cure that disease. Where is your heart with God through that? Some have financial ruin, financial problems come on. Really wasn't a result of their own. It's just there's macroeconomic things that happen and people are in trouble. Where's your heart with God in those things? Are you blaming God? Are you upset with God? Are you angry with God? Well, it's good to ask the honest questions of God. He's not, he's not afraid of the honest questions. Because honest questions help you to search deeper, to come to understanding, so that we're not tossed to and fro in our faith and our beliefs by every wind of doctrine or every wind of circumstance that comes about in our lives. What God is doing is building faithfulness in us. And faithfulness is proved out in the tough times. Are we true?
true to God. Well, isn't that the challenge that the devil laid before Job? God, he only loves you. Job only loves you, God, because you hedged him in. You bless him so much. Who wouldn't love you with all this? So God said, all right, I'll give, I'll give in to your power. And so here it comes, all these circumstances out of Job's control, all these things coming upon him. How did he face it? Is God God all the time? He does a lot of things to happen. Sometimes even wicked ones, like the, the devil, were given certain control over events in the lives of a saint, Job. We're bringing something greater about. And you realize that when you think about the lives of those who are the faithful, they had to have a vision that went beyond today, but to something future. They had to have a belief that said all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. They have to see down the road of life. They have to have a faith in who God is that goes beyond the circumstances of today to realize that God can take some pretty bad stuff and make it really good. I'd like to look at the life of a teenager today. A teenager. So if you turn with me to the book of Genesis chapter 37, I'm going to read about the life beginning the young man at the age of 17. Genesis chapter 37, verse 2, it says, this is the history of Jacob, Joseph, uh, of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was, the, was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report to them, of them to his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. And also he made him a tunic of many colors. And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now, you know what's so interesting is today, when Dagmar was reading from 1 John 3, it said this very thing, that there is this spirit in the flesh that when someone is being favored more than another, there is a hatred that comes when someone's works are bad and theirs is good. What it, Joseph brought a bad report. He was out in the field. Why? Why would he bring the bad report? Obviously, whatever they were doing, he knew wasn't good and wasn't what the father, Jacob, had told them to be doing, right? He, when he brought the bad report. So he's trying to do what's right, he, but he brings a bad report of what happened in the field. You could say, well, maybe that's not good, but here's something that happens. When somebody's doing good and somebody's doing evil... 1 John 3 says, they will, those who are doing evil will hate those that are doing good. And here we see it in the life of Joseph. We saw it in the lives of Cain and Abel. Cain hated Abel because Abel's sacrifice was right. And there's a hatred that can come up and that can be stirred up even when you're doing good things, my friends. Do you believe that? You know, the Bible says it over and over, but somehow we have trouble sometimes accepting that in life. You can do everything right, and somebody will still hate you. And we, saw, we wonder, why does that happen? It does. Why fight what is? It just is. Because when someone's works are not clean and right, they hate those whose works are. So the challenge is, Accepting. It's just going to happen. Kids, I promise you, no good deed goes unpunished. Just accept it now. It's a part of life. I've learned to live with this as a model. The more you serve, the more you will be banged on. It's just the way it is. Just accept it. Just accept that it is, and it's part of 
refining you and making you perfect. It's just a part of life. But here's Joseph with his brothers, and they see the love that Jacob had. Why did Jacob love Joseph? Well, he was said he was the son of his old age. He was probably, probably a good boy, right? I, I would say he probably was out trying to do the right thing by his father, and it just drove him crazy. It's just, oh, he's the one who's favored. He's the one that's loved. And parents, it's a good lesson, right? Don't stir your kids to wrath by favoring one. Because it, it can do that. But notice he said, so his brothers saw, verse 4, their father loved him more than all his brothers, and they hated him, and they could not speak to his parents. So rather than loving his brothers, he loved by his Now Joseph had a dream. Okay, so here's, here it is. Joseph has two dreams. In one dream, the sheaves that they're putting together in the field, all him and his brothers, they all rise up and stand up, and of course, all his brothers bow down to his feet. And then in another, he saw the sun, the moon, and 11 stars bowing down to him. And Joseph tells his family of these dreams. And so what do you think his brother said? What, we're going to bow down to you? You're going to reign over us? He reveals what's going on in his heart. He says, what's, what's good with you? Is your dream really come true? And so he does. Jacob, it says of Jacob, verse 11, and his brothers envied him when he told him the dreams, but his father kept the matter in mind. He said that a lot about Mary, too, when things were happening. She just needed to keep it in her heart. Just put it there. Don't evaluate it too much. Just put it in the heart and think about it. Now, the brothers went out. I'm just going to kind of recap this, but you can just read this for yourselves. The brothers went out to tend the sheep. And Jacob says, I want you to go out to the sheep. I want you to go out to where your brothers are and check on how they're doing and see what's going on. And so he goes in search. He can't find them where he thought they would be. Somebody says, no, they're over in a different place. So, okay, so he starts heading his way over there. And his brothers see him coming. So here is Joseph, 17 years old, going out to check on what his brothers are doing. His dad asked him to go to bring a report back. He's going there to look at them. And when his brothers see him, do you know what their thought is? Let's kill him. Now, check this in your hearts and in your minds. We talked about reconciliation last week. If you have something against your brother, you need to forgive him. Because if you don't, what can happen is slowly but surely, envy will plant a root. Bitterness will grow. Anger will start to manifest. And you'll see somebody and have a heart of hatred within you. Because... Because Jacob, uh, Joseph was loved by Jacob, they want to kill him? I think about, really, what had Joseph done that was so wrong to his brothers? He was loved. He was good. He was trying to do the right things, and he shared his dreams with his brothers, and now they want to take his life? Think of how far this had gone, how much manifestation in their heart must have been happening in order for this to come out in their conversation. This was what was in their heart. And Reuben said, no. So they threw Joseph into a pit. They threw him in a pit where there was nothing. It was an empty pit. There was no water in there. And they saw him there in the pit. And then they said, all right, well, let's go eat while he's just in this pit. And so... Reuben had thought, well, you know what, I'll come back later. And Reuben was the oldest. He thought about this, and how would it affect his father if Joseph was hurt? He thought about it in a different way. He, he, he stopped thinking about himself. He was thinking, my father loves Joseph. How will it hurt my dad if anything happens? Reuben left, and when he came back, what he found was that the brothers had sold Joseph. Ishmaelites had come by, and, and they sold him for the price of a slave, 20 shekels of silver. Now, it records here later in 
chapter 42 and verse 21 that Joseph, when they looked at him, when they had put him in the pit and when they were selling him, they recounted that his soul was in anguish, pleading with them to not do this thing. I want you to think about that because a group of his brothers saw their brother pleading for mercy, pleading for life, pleading for deliverance, and their response was, we don't hear you. I want to ask you how you would feel. Bronte, you're 17. How would you feel if your brother sold you into slavery? You all right with that? Think about it. We have the role of teenagers. How would you guys think about it if those who were your own blood, who you loved and trusted, sold you into slavery? He's 17. And here his life is being given away by his older brothers. Did he have any control in this? Even if you recount everything Joseph did, even if you can say, well, he shouldn't have given the bad report and he shouldn't have told the dreams, was it worthy of this? Really? He'd wear their hatred and envy had taken them, put Joseph in a spot out of his control. Now, these are the moments where in life we say, God, why did you let this happen? God, why would you allow this to happen? God, where are you? God, didn't you hear me crying out? I was screaming. I was pleading. My soul was in anguish asking for deliverance. Where were you when they sold me? Where they took me out of my freedom. They took me away from my father. They took me away from my family. And they sold me to slave traders. Where were you, God? See, this is the moment where we humanly often are at when we go through trials that are sore and terrible and things out of our control. It was out of his hands. He couldn't stop what was happening to him. It was completely out of his control. I want you to notice what happens through all this process. Notice here in Genesis 39 and verse 1, so now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. How would you like that to be bought? To be taken from freedom and bought. And notice verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. Why does God write that? Because he knows that we would think, where's God in all this? Here's the son who was loved. Here's the son that was out doing his father's bidding. Here's the son who was taken. Here's the son who was bound up. Here's the son who was sold into slavery. Where's God? God's right there. God's right there with him. You see, in the moments when we humanly want to question where is God in events that are sore and terrible and out of our control, God wants us to remember, I'm right there. See, Joseph was a young man who had seemingly a desire to be with God. Every time he spoke of God and, and gave testimony throughout his life that we read about, he was thinking about God as God in his life. He was looking to him in faith. When he came to his dreams, it was, he was looking at God. When he gave interpretations, he knew they came from God. When he came for blessing, it came from God. He was looking to God in his life. This was the manner that we find spoken by his own mouth and recorded in God's word for us. He was one who acknowledged God. And in the midst of his trial, it doesn't say that he ever did anything against God.
but it does say that God was with him, that the Lord was with him. And he was a successful man <laughs> as a slave, but God made him successful. God elevated him, and he was in the house of his master, his master the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. Isn't that an awesome thing? Here is this man of the world, this Egyptian. And what does he see? He recognizes in Joseph that Yah, the God of Israel, is with him. It's like, well, I can see how God blesses whatever you're doing. I love that. The smartest thing the Egyptian did was say, be over everything I have. Because I want God's blessing on whatever is happening of mine, and it will be because he's blessing you. And he saw that, and he put him in charge. He saw in Joseph things that were godly, that were good, that were only from God. Even though Joseph had been sold as a slave, there he is a slave, and there is God with him, and there is Joseph being blessed in what he does. Now, as it comes on, his blessing, verse 4, So he found favor in his sight and served him, and then he made him overseer over all his house, and all that he had he put under his authority. So it was from that time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. When you find someone like this in life, you want them involved. When you see somebody who has God's spirit, you want them involved in your life. And one of the reasons we get together, even during the week, we pray together, or we Bible study together, or we do things. That we want to be involved in each other's lives. Helping one another, encouraging one another, seeking that blessing that comes on, from a person because God is with them. And so thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand and did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. So he trusted Joseph so much, he's like, I don't even oversee my own stuff, I just leave it to Joseph. I know I can trust this man. He was so good and so godly, and God was with him so greatly. But, of course, his success brought on desire of Potiphar's wife. She saw how blessed he was in the house. She saw the authority, the power. She saw his goodness. And what she wanted was to have it for herself. She wanted for herself. She lusted for him. Now, did she love Joseph? No way. See, a godly woman wouldn't think that way in those terms. She wanted him because of the power, the prestige he had. She wanted something for herself. So here he is, a young man, has this great authority given to him. He's being blessed. The house is being blessed. And she wants him for herself. And notice how Joseph responds. Verse 11, when Joseph, or excuse me, back up in verse 8, he refused and said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So in his slavery, where is Joseph's mind? on God, on being honorable, on doing what's right. Now, in our trials, this is when that's all being tested. You know, Joseph could have easily said, you know what, where is God? Here I am in slavery, here I am, and I'm doing pretty well for myself. And he could have been all puffed up with the vanity of doing good in life, couldn't he? He could have just started being puffed up, and now, hey, it's me, I'm the great one here. I'm the one doing all this. He could have been puffed up, and when she came, he could have been like, well, you know, maybe this is, this is all right. But his thinking wasn't of pride. It was in humility before God saying, here I am for you, God. That tells me that in his trial, he knew God was with him. In his trial, he knew he was still for God. In his trial, there was
was still a dedication that he had. It was unwavering. I want you to think about that because when trials and hardships come in life, what do we do carnally? We start to question God. We start to doubt God. We wonder about his goodness. Sometimes we even wonder about his existence. But yet Joseph, in the midst of his slavery, is saying, no, I won't do this sin against God. But one day she finds him alone, verse 11, and no one was inside. In verse 12, she caught him by the garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. He wanted to get as far away as she could. How do you know she didn't have any real love or affection for Joseph? Because when he wouldn't accept, she was willing to destroy him. She told the story that he had come into the house, that he had made the advances, that he tried to lie with her, that he was the one who was being evil. Was there anything in Joseph that wasn't good and honorable in his dealings with this woman? Didn't he do it all right? Wasn't he thinking of his master? Wasn't he thinking of their marriage relationship? Wasn't he thinking of God and doing what was right? And when the temptation came and she actually grabbed a hold of him, he didn't give in to it. He actually ran the other way, not wanting to take part in sin. Was there anything in this circumstance that as a slave, Joseph could have done better? His conduct was honorable and right. And how was he rewarded for his goodness? When Potiphar heard the story from his wife, it said Potiphar was angry, and he had him cast into prison, in the prison where they held the captives those who were imprisoned by Pharaoh himself. So he's a slave who now becomes a prisoner. What was his evil act? How did he get to prison? How did he get to this point? He didn't do it. He didn't arrive there by any sin of his own as far as what we can see. But he was cast into prison. And notice what it says in verse 21. But the Lord was with, with Joseph and showed him mercy, and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And here's another opportunity. He could have said, where are you, God? God. Why would you let this? I was doing well for myself. I was, I was succeeding. I was being successful. Everything was good. I didn't bring this. I didn't know sin. Why would you punish me like this? You see, that's where our minds can go. When we think that we're being good or we're being righteous or we're walking with God and we see trial and tragedy and things happen outside of our control, it is so easy, isn't it, to blame God somehow? And maybe we don't do it with our mouths, but maybe in the depths of our heart, in the secret places where we don't like to go too often, we have a doubt inside. Where are you? I hear that question a lot. Where are you, God? Where did God say he was? He was right there with him. Friends, God is teaching something so powerfully through this life of Joseph and this, this life of this teenage man that you're going to go through hardships. I promise you, you're going to go through hard times. The question is, will you be faithful to God in those times as he will be faithful to you to be with you? That's God's heart toward you. You know, in... in um, Luke chapter 18, it talks about we ought to always pray and not lose heart. Why would we lose heart when we pray? Because things are tough, because we're not getting the answers we want. Things aren't happening as fast as we want. And so Jesus told the parable of a woman that came to an unjust judge, and because she continually came, he gave her what she asked for. He said, will not my father speedily avenge you when you come to him? And, but it says something so interesting. He says, though he bears long with you. 
See, here's the truth. When you go through rough times, when you feel like you're being unjustly treated, and maybe you are being unjustly treated, in the sense of how we would reconcile it humanly, or maybe we're going through a tough time, or maybe we're going through a trial, and you're, you're looking at your life, and you're saying, what did I do to bring this on? I, I, was, I was with you, God. Here I am. Things happen outside of our control. We, we don't have a say in it. We have no control, no power to stop it. God is saying, when you go through that, through it with you. When you suffer, I suffer with you. I am on your side to be with you through what you are facing. I am faithful and I cannot be unfaithful towards you. God is with those who are with him, as it says in 2 Chronicles chapter 14. God is with those who are with him. And what is so beautiful about Joseph is that all his coming a slave, and he could have been so angry at God for what his brothers did and being put into slavery. And all that he was doing then in the, trying to be honorable and good in the slave's house, and he gets thrown into prison, he could have so easily said, I'm not with you anymore, God. But that wasn't his heart. He didn't hold any injustice toward God. Was any of the injustice God's? Was any of what happened God's? But what's so amazing is that God was there with him in the midst of his trials to walk through the trials. God left him in the trials to go through them with him. Joseph was a man of faith who had a vision. And he had a simple reality as we look at his whole life this is my life, God, and whatever happens, as long as I'm with you, it's all good. See, that simplifies life quite a bit, doesn't it? No matter what, come what may, as long as I'm with you, God, it's good. Come what may, as long as I'm with you, it's good. Things will come. Hardships will come upon you. The more you do for God, you can expect it. And the frustrations of life that come on us because we often get angry when we're wronged, when we feel something so unjust, like what Joseph had, when these things happen in our lives, probably in much smaller ways, I don't know if any of you have ever been sold into slavery, but we have these things in life. We get angry and frustrated about them. We don't see that in Joseph's life. We see one who remained faithful through it all, and it says that the Lord was with him, verse 21. Genesis chapter 39, verse 21 the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. Even in prison. In prison, he showed him mercy. And he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. <laughs> Even in the prisons. I mean, isn't that awesome? You'd say, you can't be much lower, but as, as high as I can make you in that prison, I will. God is like, I I'm going to make you the top. You, you know, you, you might be in a place you don't want to be, but I'm going to make it as good as it can be for you because you're faithful and I'm with you. And what did we see again? The testimony of the jail keeper. Why did it say that he put him over everything? It said the keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. 
there had to be such a spirit in Joseph that when he came to the house of Potiphar and he came to the prison of the keeper of the prison, that what they saw was, this man is for God. This man is for God, and his commitment to God in the midst of his trial is so great. How can I not but acknowledge what is happening in his life? And this, my friends, is the testimony that we bear witness to in our lives when we go through trials, when we are persecuted, when we are mocked, when we are scorned, when we are unjustly treated, when we go through sickness, when we go through disease, when we go through financial hardships, when we go through hardships of any kind. How will you go through it? Will you come through as the sweet savor of God because you know that God is with you? That if you were going through the hurricane right now, that what would be coming out is a peace that God has left you alive. For what? For his glory and purposes. That in what you do, waiting in a line for gas or doing whatever, that you would do it for God. And who knows when such tragedy might come on us. How will we go through it with God reflecting his glory that it would be a testimony to those around us that God is with them. But see, this relationship was something that was in place prior to Joseph going into slavery, prior to his going into prison. It might have been refined by the testing. It might have been proved out what was going on. But it was already present. God was already with this one, and he was responding to it. His life was in goodness already. He was a blessing to his father. God was using him. Now we know the story that a butler and a baker came into that prison. A butler and a baker. They both had dreams. And they were very disturbed because they couldn't understand their dreams. But notice what happens. Verse 3. So the butler and baker, they put, Pharaoh put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison and the place where Joseph was confined. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them. So they were in custody for a while. And the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt who were confined in the prison, had a dream, both of them, each man's dream in one night, in each man's dream with its own interpretation. And Joseph came into them in the morning and looked at them, and he saw that they were sad. A man of compassion, a man of consideration of others. Just that. Doesn't that tell you about the character of this one? He saw something different. He saw they were sad. So he asked the Pharaoh's officers who were with him in the custody of the Lord's house, saying, why do you look so sad today? And they said to him, we each have had a dream and there is no interpreter of it. And that's what Joseph said to them. Do not interpretations belong to God? There's an answer. God knows the answer. And so he said, tell them to me, please. Who did Joseph trust in that he could help these men? He saw their sadness, he saw their countenance, and he said, isn't God the interpreter of the dream? My friends, I don't know if you're going to run into somebody when you're in the midst of your trials that needs help. But I think it's an amazing thing when you think about Joseph being in prisoner and one who we could so logically, carnally say, could be totally embittered about his life. I did nothing wrong, I was a slave. I did nothing wrong in slavery and I became a prisoner. He could have been so bitter, but he wasn't. He was thinking about somebody else in his trial. So here he is in his trial. He's considering them. And when they have a dilemma that they can't answer, he says, but God can answer this for you. God can tell you what's going to happen. Now, in your life, you may not come across that person with the dream, but what about something else? You might be going through hardship, and if you're so bound up in your own hardship that you can't look out at the interest of others, will you even be ready to serve when the opportunity comes up? Will you even be looking at the sadness in someone else, or will you be so bent on your own unhappiness, or your own dilemma, or your own trial, 
that you won't be able to see it in somebody else. See, I, I would submit to you that what Joseph had was an incredible love. It's just truly incredible, an incredible love for God that kept flowing out of his life. And that when he had opportunity to do good, he was because he had a great love for God. And here he sees sadness of somebody else. Friends, you have God in you, do you not? Have you been baptized? Have you received the power of God within you? So that when trials and temptations and hurts come on people, that you are there not of yourself, but you can say, isn't God the one who comforts? Isn't God the one who restores? Isn't God the one who forgives? Isn't God the one who can do all things? The interpretation of a dream is a miracle. Do you not know that you have the same spirit in you? The spirit that gave wisdom to Joseph, the spirit that gives wisdom to God's servants, it's the same spirit. It's the same God. Would your answer be, I, I don't know if I can help you, but, but God. He said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Does not provision belong to God? Does not protection does not wisdom, understanding, insight. What doesn't belong in his hand? Joseph was there to be a vessel to those who were in prison with him because he saw them being sad. How do you respond through your own trials? Are you looking to continue to serve in the midst of them? To allow God to be great in your weakness. See, I think this is such a beautiful thing. And so Joseph gave the interpretations that the butler who bore the cup, that he would again in three days put the cup back in Pharaoh's hand. He would live. And to the baker who had the birds come and eat the bread, he was told that in three days he would lose his head, that he would die. He gave the interpretation that God wanted them to have. And when these things had come about and he had told the butler, he said, now when you get out, remember me. Remember me. But he didn't. He forgot says that when the butler was restored, verse 21, then he restored the chief butler to the butlering again, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them, yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. You know, Joseph could have had that hope in that moment, right? He could have been saying, I get it. I'm gonna, God's going God's to give me the interpretation of the dream. The dreams are going to be interpreted. And because the interpretation is going to come true, and the butler is going to tell Pharaoh that it was true, Pharaoh will want to use me in some way. I'm getting out. This is so good. Remember me when you get out. Tell Pharaoh about what I can do, about what God can do through me, and I'll get out of here. It didn't happen that way. He left him there forgotten. I want you to think about that as well because, you know, it's easy to read through the life of Joseph and it's easy when you know the ending and you can look back. You know, everything in life is so good when you have, you know, hindsight, right? Hindsight, they say, is 2020 because you can see perfectly how it all worked out just right. But when you're going through the stuff, it doesn't feel so good, does it? It hurts when you are in prison it hurts when you're a slave. It hurts when you've been wronged and have been unjustly treated. It hurts when you are suffering, and though you didn't bring it on yourself, it was somebody else. And it hurts when that you have hope 
that you would finally be restored and you're knowing that this is how God's going to do it and you're looking and saying, this is it, this is the time, this is when it will happen, and it doesn't happen. He did an amazing thing here. He gave them an interpretation that said, one of you will be set free in three days and one of you will lose your head in three days and be hanged in three days. He gave a perfect interpretation of life and death and he's just being a prisoner still. So the question I asked you at the beginning is, when you go through these times in life and you feel the injustice and you feel the wrong, do you get angry with God? Do you question where are you, God? I want you to think about that and meditate on that. I want you to pursue that in your heart and ask, is this me, or am I like Joseph? Do I see the example of Joseph and say, in the midst of my trials, I know you are with me, that you are true, that you are God, and that you are suffering with me through it, and that you do not leave me or forsake me, because neither tribulation, nor trial, nor persecution, nor death, nor anything can separate you from the love of God. Friends, we need to know how deep God's love is toward us and his commitment to us is because we do go through these trials and what helps us through them and helps us come through as the saints of God is his absolute unwavering commitment to you personally. Garrett, Denise, Eddie, Lynn, Greg, Dusty, Brad, Dagmar, all of you say your name to you. He's with you. He is with you. God is with you while you are with him. All you have to say is, here I am, God. I love that you're with me. Boom, he's with you. There isn't much we have to do. As it says, salvation is in your mouth and in your heart. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe that he was raised from the dead, you shall be saved. He is not far, he's near. He's here like this saying, here I am. Let me comfort you. Let me walk with you. Let me pick you up. Let me encourage you. We just have to acknowledge his presence. We just have to say, I love that you're here. He just wants that simple faith. It doesn't take a lot. But it turns everything around in life. Think about that. Let's praise him. Let's worship him now. And we'll continue, God willing, the next time I have a chance to speak.